Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by The Mosaic Company. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soil School. Today, we're going to wrap up the 2025 season with a look at the power of organic matter and how it can help grow high-yielding crops. Um, we're also going to look and discuss how you can build organic matter. It can be a long process, but there are you know, some simple steps uh, growers can make to improve soil structure and make an impact. To dig into organic matter, I'm pleased to be joined by my guest. Uh, she is University of Minnesota Soil Extension Specialist, uh, Jody DeYoung Hughes. Jody, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me here. Hey, we tackled uh, this subject four years ago on the Soil School, and, and that video is one of the most popular in this series. Um, I thought now is a good time to, to, to revisit some of that information and then add some new perspectives, um, especially on what growers can do to tap in to the power of organic matter on their farms. Um, let's start um, with what organic matter means to you. Uh, you always use uh, the word resilience. I do. So there's the academic term, you know, on how it's formed and everything. But the main thing is, is that it helps your soil become more resilient, which means if you have a drought that your soil can last longer than people who have lower organic matter in their fields. And so I really like that word resilient. The more you bang it up, it kind of, it can bounce back. Now, how does soil type impact organic matter? You know, and, and what are the implications here, especially, um, you know, when it comes to water availability during the, grow, during the growing season? Well, you know, our sands just cannot hold the same amount of water as our clays can. Clays, an individual clay particle is microscopic and it can hold water and nutrients along every little edge and nook and cranny, whereas sand is more of a ball shape and, you know, can only hold it in certain areas. So um, our sands just won't build as high, but they can actually change faster. So if you're starting with something like 0.5% organic matter in a sand, it can build up to one and a half a lot faster than a clay can change from a, a point and a half, right? Um, clays usually have a higher organic matter content to begin with, and they're harder to build just because of the nature of clay. So when people have a sand or a clay, I don't want them to think, you know, they're gonna have this gorgeous structured soil in their sand. They probably won't, mm. <laughs> but they can look for other things. Now, what can that additional water availability mean to a growing corn crop, for example? You know, how much is there? And I, I think you've got an amazing slide here that really tracks, you know, what it can do for a corn crop. Yeah. Um, so the slide that you'll be showing there is looking at if you have 1%, 2 3 4 5% organic matter in your soil. If you have the difference between a sand, a silt loam, or a silty clay loam, so say sand to clay, we'll just say that. Um, how many more days can your plant grow, go without water? So we're looking at corn when it's at its max production and it's taken up a quarter inch of um, water a day from that soil profile. If you have very low organic matter, say 1% in your field, whether you're sand, silt, or clay, um, you're going to need a rain every day, day and a half to keep that corn from getting stressed. If you have 3% organic matter, you're looking at the difference between like four to five and a half days before you need that rain, which is a huge, mm. huge deal. And if you're blessed with 5% organic matter, now you're looking at every week or 10 days, you need the same amount of rain. So that is the power of organic matter to hold on to water for you. Let's take a look at the, the nutrients in that organic matter and, and what that means um, you know, for meeting the nutrient needs of a growing crop, Jody? Well, since organic matter is made from whatever died on top of it, basically, uh, it can have a range of nutrients. But the USDA has a, a list that says there's about a thousand pounds of nitrogen in 1% organic matter. There's about a hundred pounds of phosphorus and potassium and sulfur. And then there's over 11,000 pounds of carbon. And this is per acre per 1% of organic matter. And if you add up, well, you know, what, what do those nutrients mean? Um, you know, uh, prices fluctuate. So this is the prices of about six months ago. Uh, you're saving, you have about $1,200, $1,300 worth of nutrients. Just those ones I listed there 
there's a lot of other ones in there as well that um, can help feed the plant when you're having a really good year. Yep. So you'll have more of it mineralized from that organic matter based on, you know, your uh, how warm it is and how wet it is out there. So if you have 3% organic matter, you have a lot of nutrients stored in that soil. Let's talk about um, how long it takes to increase soil organic matter. You know, going from 1% to 3 2 to 4%, for example, you know, what are we looking at? It could be a while. Um, and like I said, with the sands, though, it will be a, a fairly fairly quick in geologic time. It will be, you know, four or five years. You can build it a percent, percent, let's just say a percent. Mm -hmm. And for clays, though, if you're starting off at uh, 3%, it, it can take a while to get to 4%. It can be seven, eight, nine years. So if you hear somebody saying, oh, I increased my organic matter in one year by 1%, that that's not, it, you can't. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, you just cannot do that unless you accidentally um, soil sampled a cow pie or something like that. Uh, so it takes a while, but what what's nice about it is as you're doing the things to increase your soil organic matter, you're getting other benefits besides just building organic matter. Now, what do you tell growers um, you know, who want to go faster, you know, as fast as possible to tap into the power of organic matter? Um, you know, you, you say you can make some immediate impacts, um, you know, on on soil stru structure, you know, things like improving soil aggregates. Yes. So what I say, if you see any erosion out in your field, don't worry about the biology. Don't worry about, you know, all these fancy things right now. Worry about stopping erosion. So. And you do that by covering the soil. Now, if that's their first step, you can cover it with residue or you can cover it with uh, cover crops. If you've already got that going for you, you know, then you know to uh, go even less tillage because soil structure is going to be built in your soil um, when you reduce your tillage and you add in anything with roots, so crop or cover crop. The roots will help build those little aggregates and soil structure and tillage always takes away. So it's a balance of how much tillage do you do by how much you're building. Hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you also talk about, you know, that impact of residue, you know, the ground cover uh, provided by, you know, cover crops. Not everybody's doing cover crops, but, you know, you mentioned even, you know, even standing corn stalks can make a difference. Yes, they can uh, when they capture the snow. Uh, more evenly across your field too, which is nice. Um, instead of having you know areas of huge drifts when we get those snow years. Uh, so with the um, corn crop, it, it's the only crop that we grow in the northern U.S. that actually builds organic matter. Uh, most of our other crops take it away. So that's where um, adding manures or adding cover crops really helps out. So to build the organic matter, you need biomass. You just lots of biomass. And people think if they bury that biomass, you know, like do tillage and put the residue down into the soil, um, well, then you're building your soil, right? And <laughs> what they don't understand is, or not quite remembering, is that in one cup of soil, there can be 9 billion microbes and they love residue and carbon, the carbon in the residue. And so they take in that carbon and like we do with a donut, right? And then you respire it off as CO2. They do the same thing. So there your carbon goes boop, back up to the atmosphere and it gets intercepted in the soil and not put into organic matter. Let's look at, uh, I guess, the impact of reducing tillage. You know, we talk a lot about tillage. You know, not everybody, you know, can run a no-till system, um, you know, but there's plenty of opportunities to reduce tillage and building, you know, build water holding capacity. You know, what do you tell growers, you know, who really can't commit to a no-till system? Um, you know, it, that's black and white. If you say moldboard plow and no-till, and we have um, all these different ones in the middle, so many different choices out there now. And so mainly they just need to know the difference between a shank, a disc, and a coulter. And if you got that down, you can figure out a piece of equipment that works best for you. So when you're looking at a disc, a disc tells the soil where to cut, and it, it's very tough on structure and aggregates, breaks them apart very easily. And like if you see a road being built, you usually see a disc sitting out there. And the main reason why is because it just makes it all really fine particles, and that's great for 
you know, create an erode, but that's not what we want in our fields. And so a disc is very destructive. So if you do use a disc, keep it shallow, but you're destroying the structure up at the surface and that's how the rain tries to get in. So even a shallow disc, if used too much, can really hurt with water infiltration. And then you have the points or shanks where they go into the soil and the soil kind of separates along the natural plane, so not as much destruction. So what I ask farmers to do is to go more towards the uh, chisel points and things like that, uh, mole knives, uh, thinner ones, straighter ones, because the wider ones and the twisted ones will move more soil. So even somebody with a chisel plow can change out the, the points on there and become more conservation oriented. Mm -hmm. It will leave more residue out there in case they can't afford a brand new strip till machine. Mm -hmm. That's my other love. That's your other love. Uh, tell us a little bit about strip till. Strip till only tills a third of the soil and then you plant right back in there. So it comes through and it cuts the soil, uh, residue, pushes it to the side. There's usually a shank or coulters. You could put down a lot of your um, a fertilizer at that time and closing discs to capture it all. It makes this little raised berm out there. And then you plant right back into it. And GPS has made that possible yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So does reducing tillage also, uh, I guess, help increase a uh, field's, um, you know, uh, carrying capacity? I mean, because a big challenge we got here is compaction. Um, is it almost a one-two punch? Uh, yeah, there are so many benefits to improving, well, Trying to improve your organic matter content will have all these other ripple effects from it. And if you start building aggregation and structure in your soil, those little little head clods out there, you know, you pick up a root and they're hanging there. Those are like mini um, columns in the soil that help hold up the weight of equipment. The more tillage you do, the more you break those apart. The more roots you have, the more you build them. So again, it's that balance I talked about. And so when you're doing that, when you're um, trying to have less tillage, you're going to have more biomass, more stalks out there, which actually do have a little bit of a carrying capacity. Um, corn does, but I wouldn't count on mm. um, soybeans to have much carrying capacity. That yeah. their, their residue is pretty fragile. Uh, those old soybeans. Hey, mm -hmm. um, hey, well, we're only scratching the surface of this topic, but... Uh, you know, and that's all the time we have for it on this episode. But I know uh, you'll be digging deeper into the topic as as part of the 2026 Northern Soil Compaction Conference uh, webinar series, Jody. Uh, that runs through February, and our viewers can check out more about that online. Um, it's always great to have you on the Soil School, and hey, thank, thank you. you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me.